Hello, my name is Michelle Dean, and I'm going to be doing a lecture today for APP to APP virtual lectures. Um, I am going to tell you a little bit about myself first. Um, again, my name is Michelle. I've been a physician assistant for over 18 years with the bulk of my experience in oncology. I have worked in medical oncology and solid tumor and currently work in liquid tumor. Um, I also have a large experience in surgical oncology and have dabbled a little bit in radiation oncology as well. And today we're going to talk about the role of advanced practice providers in oncology. So what we'll talk about today is first, we're going to set the ground and talk about um, the current state of oncology. I want you to understand the current state of the field of oncology and the need for advanced practice providers in the field of oncology. We'll identify the various roles that APPs play in oncology, and we'll learn about the different avenues in which APPs can take to pursue a career in oncology. So first, let's start by talking about cancer. So now cancer is considered a chronic disease because more people are living longer with cancer and they're surviving cancer. So they're facing the lifelong side effects of cancer. It is the second leading cause of death in the United States. In this year alone, 2022, it's projected that there will be close to 2 million new cancer cases and over 600,000 deaths from cancer. If you look over here to the graph on the right, you will see the most common cancer diagnosis. Breast cancer is the most common with over 50%. And then lung, prostate, colorectal cancers are also very common cancers. In 2019, there were an estimated 16.9 million cancer survivors in the US with a projected increase to over 22 million in the next eight years. New cancer diagnoses as well as cancer related deaths are also predicted to rise by nearly 30 million and 16 million respectively in the year 2040. So cancer rates are higher in countries with higher life expectancy, education level, and standard of living. This is because in these countries, patients have more access to screening and detection, um, and they also have more access to treatment, which helps them to live longer so there's more patients with cancer. There are some cancers that don't necessarily follow this trend. Um, and they have more of a direct correlation to lifestyle and education level. These are cancers such as the HPV-related cancer. So you think of cervical cancer, or anosquamous cancer, or some head and neck cancers. Or we think about cancers that are related to things like drinking and cigarette smoking. It's also important to note that the pandemic, the COVID-19 pandemic will alter some of these statistics over the next few years um, because there's a large time period where patients weren't getting screened for cancer or weren't getting timely treatment for their cancer. So this is just some basic stuff that all of us as healthcare providers should, should know. Um, the World Health Organization talks about this all of the time. So there are many risk factors for cancers, obviously are tobacco and alcohol. Um, and of course, we all know that diet, obesity, and physical inactivity play a large role in many diseases, but they also play a large role in the rate of cancer, as well as cancer recurrence. Um, and we also know that obesity, while some cancers aren't necessarily related to obesity, they that obesity does have a huge impact on patients with cancer. You know, chemotherapy adjustments have to be made for people that are obese. Um, people that are obese have complications related to surgery or aren't surgical candidates at all. Um, ju but jumping back, other risk factors for cancer include air pollution, chronic infections, like again, the HPVs, H. pylori, hepatitis, and Epstein-Barr virus. Um, screening, detection, and early diagnosis are key in better outcomes for cancer. So colonoscopy, colonoscopy is the only tool that is a screening tool and a preventative tool all in one because it can remove polyps. And now the screening age for colonoscopy is set at 45. Pap smears, looking for cervical cancers, mammograms, routine dental care is super important so that we're looking for head and neck cancers. And of course, timely referral for evaluation and treatment of cancers. And while it sounds corny to say where you go first matters, it's, it's very important that you have a very good thorough um, workup and evaluation of a cancer. If you think about it, a 300 slice CT versus a 600 slice CT can be the difference in between diagnosing somebody with metastatic disease or not, and then give them getting the appropriate care for their cancer. So next, let's look at the oncology workforce. So ASCO, which is the American Society for Clinical Oncology, it monitors and assesses the workforce that is available to diagnose, treat, and care for people with cancer. 
And as time goes on, as there are more cancer patients, evaluating and understanding the workforce is, beginning, is going to grow in importance as well. In 2020, there are about 13,000 oncologists in practice um, in the United States, and about 20% of these were over the age of 64, and less than 13% were under the age of 40. And this is important, right? So age is very important. As the number of cancer patients grow, the number of oncologists is not increasing in proportion as well. They're actually out of proportion. So this is very important. More are retiring than are coming into practice. And so there is a gap there for care for cancer patients. Another important component to look at is rural America. So one in six Americans live in a rural area and about 60% of these rural counties in the US have no oncologist. Urban counties on the other hand have 20 times more oncologists per square mile than rural counties. So cancer care in rural America is very important to take note of. Most of the United States top trained oncologists are trained at large NCI centers. Um, and so when they finish their training in these places where there's a lot of research and there's cutting edge care, they're often recruited to work at the same center that they trained or they're recruited to other large NCI centers or they practice in large metropolis areas. So these less desirable geographic regions are often lacking in oncologic care. And this is a big deal because, you know, patients that live in these smaller areas are less likely to have access to good care or care at all. And so this is a, actually a place where APPs can come into play, which we'll talk about later. If you look at the map over here on the right, this is also from ASCO, um, and it highlights kind of the areas where there's a large concentrations of oncologists. And you'll see that there, these dark blue states um, are actually very heavy with oncologists, and this is where the large cancer centers are. So if you look North Carolina, there is Duke. In New York, there's Memorial Sloan Kettering. Kettering. In Texas, there's MD Anderson. And so these have a higher population of oncologists versus if you're to look at the north, you can see like in Montana and in the Dakotas, the number of oncologists is actually very low. So, so how can we kind of help with this workforce? Well, this is where the advanced practice provider can have a big role. It's anticipated that by 2025, the demand for oncology services is expected to increase by 40% or more. However, the supply of oncologists is only expected to grow by 25%. So there is a mismatch there. Currently, about 75% of oncology practices now utilize APPs to meet the growing demand for cancer care. You know, they're using them to enha enhance their care delivery models and improve continuity of care and expand value-based care in oncology. And if APPs, you know, they can be an asset to the field of oncology, as long as you have a group of physicians or a practice that is willing to embrace them, you know, physicians that will take the time to embrace them, train them and have the group, um, you know, kind of embrace them as a care team, the, the value is, is very high there. So a little bit more basics about oncology. So oncology is more than just chemotherapy. I know a lot of people that aren't in the field of oncology kind of think of cancer and chemotherapy. Well, it's more than that. There are three basic areas or the major areas, I guess I should say, of oncology, and that is medical oncology, radiation oncology, and surgical oncology. And taking a deeper dive into those areas, there's hematology oncology. Hematology oncology is what we think of as liquid tumors. So that's blood cancers, um, cancers in the lymph system. So leukemias, lymphomas, multiple myelomas. Um, gynecologic oncology. So anything in the reproductive system of a female, you know, uterine, cervical cancer. Neuro-oncology is encompassing anything that's in the brain or the spine. And so caring for disease that's primarily primarily located there or disease that is metastasized from other areas to the brain or the spine. Pediatric oncology is a whole field in itself. Thoracic oncology, though, so thinking lung or esophageal cancer. Urologic oncology is prostate, bladder, urothelial cancer. GI oncology encompasses the whole GI system and neuroendocrine tumors. Colorectal is just as it sounds, colon, rectum, and also anus. And then cutaneous oncology is more like our skin or melanomas. And all of these, while they're all very special, they kind of all work together depending on the disease. If you have a large rectal tumor, as an example, sometimes that tumor can be, you know, invading the bladder or the prostates or the ureters. And so when it comes time for an operation, oftentimes you have to involve team members from radiation oncology to radiate during the operation. You have to involve your, you know, urologist 
urology oncologist to help with the urological piece of the operation and a colorectal surgeon. So all of these, while separate, all kind of play a role depending on the type of cancer that a patient has. So when we think about oncology and specialization, as I said, there's so many different types of oncology. Specialization, you know, is, is important. It leads to expertise, which leads to improved outcomes. So kind of, I think of cars, it's something I don't know very much about, but I don't think that you would necessarily take like your Porsche to the Ford dealership for maintenance. While, you know, mechanics at both likely know a little bit about each of the cars more than I do for sure. They're very different beasts. And the same is true for cancers. Cancer are very different and the way we care for cancers are very different. Um, so specialization allows not only for more advances in treatment and in care delivery, but it allows these providers that are specialized to you know, stay on top of current trends and also have the ability to recognize patients and the symptoms related to the treatments that they give them because they're always kind of seeing the same thing over and over again. And similarly, APPs, depending on you know, the work setting, have the ability to specialize in certain types of cancer as well. Um, of course, specialization is not always possible, particularly in the community or in rural settings where the, the providers have to kind of be the jack of all trades. But oftentimes, some of the patients that are seen in these community or rural settings have gone to larger academic or tertiary centers for initial consultations, and they come back to the community setting and kind of where the playbook is kind of used and they kind of execute the treatment plan. Another area kind of a specialization, which is kind of all over the news these days is precision medicine. And this is just basically when we think about our genetic makeup, our genetic makeup kind of determines all these things in our life, you know, our height, our hair color, but it also determines our propensity to develop a cancer or what certain types of cancer or how a cancer will behave. And so precision medicine looks at this, looks at our DNA in order to best target treatment for our cancers. And this also, again, leads to improved outcomes. So where do APPs fit in the mix in oncology? And the answer is everywhere. APPs can fit in everywhere in oncology. So they have a big role in partnerships, partnerships with patients and partnerships with the physicians with whom they work. Um, they have a huge role, of course, in inpatient and outpatient clinical settings. They work in surgery and procedures. They have a big, big role in survivorship. They can work in access and they can contribute to value-based care. So just like any chronic disease, cancer patients require frequent visits, um, sometimes daily for treatments like radiation, weekly for chemotherapy, or intermittently for things like IV fluids or IV um, antibiotics or maybe transfusions. And so APPs can become an important member of the patient's care team and are often involved in all of these you know, visits, whether it's restaging or surveillance or you know, a walk-in patient. And in my experience, patients very much look to the APPs that they've grown accustomed to seeing during these visits, you know, for guidance, for care, for compassion. Um, and then the other relationship is that between a physician and an APP. So in any practice that utilizes APPs, the physician APP partnership is important and so beneficial for everyone, not just for the patient, but for the whole care team. So, you know, if you have a good relationship, you can distribute the patient volume between the providers. So physicians can see some patients, APPs can see some patients, which provides patients with more options for scheduling. Having a partnership between an APP and physician also allows for patients to have additional provider contacts. Um, and APPs, you know, they can work in every discipline of oncology to kind of help increase access, improve continuity of care, and decrease provider burden, which subsequently will lead to decreased burnout in providers, physicians, and APPs alike. And additionally, you know, these partnerships are, are great in academic centers because APPs can help kind of relie, relieve um, some trainees um, because trainees, as we all know, now have a work week that they cannot exceed about 80 hours or so. So APPs play a big role in this as well. So the inpatient outpatient clinical setting. So this is kind of an obvious one. We know that APPs can play an important role in both the inpatient and outpatient setting to enhance continuity of care for our cancer patients. So many cancer patients will often at some point require hospitalization, um, whether it be for a planned treatment or a planned surgery or an unexpected admission due to a complication. 
And so it's very nice often for the, the, the patients to see a familiar face when they have the APP come in. The APP, you know, it might not be the admitting team, but the APP is there and they kind of know this patient's history. And so it's very good for, for patients to have this, but also for other members of the healthcare team to know like, oh, call that APP. They know all about this patient. Um, and so this familiarity can increase patient satisfaction and actually lead to better outcomes as well. So another area um, that APPs can work in is in surgery and procedures. Um, just like in any other surgery setting, APPs can be a first assist, and this is no different than for surgical oncology. Actually having APPs that routinely come to the OR with the surgeons is very important. Surgical oncology you know, requires a special skill set. It's a very different setting than general surgery, um, and it's kind of understanding the disease too. And so these APPs with experience understand the disease and their role in the operation. And again, trainee relief, many residents and fellows have a cap on their work week, especially in the operating room. And so APPs and trainees and academic settings awful, often work together um, to, to assign OR assignments for the week to make sure that trainees don't exceed work hours, to make sure that all the operations are able to get done. Um, port clinics. So many cancer patients, if not all cancer patients, require some sort of venous access. Um, and so that comes in the form of a venous access de device, which is a port or a PIC line. And so in large centers, APPs will man the port clinic. This is kind of doing all the pre-procedural workup for ports. Um, and participating in insertion and removal of ports. And by having APPs do this, we're able to, you know, expedite patients getting ports, which means we're able to expedite them getting to treatment sooner, which is actually all around helpful. Bone marrow biopsies. So many APPs perform bone marrow biopsies. I do this almost every day in my current job. And bone marrow biopsies are necessary for many patients with liquid tumors. Um, and, and they have to be done frequently. Um, lumbar punctures are done for diagnosis. Um, or for administration of chemotherapy. So chemotherapy is given intrathecally through a lumbar puncture. I do this every day at work as well, um, or through an Omaya reservoir, um, which is located a little implant by neurosurgery up in the head. And then cutaneous procedures. So um, in skin clinics, many APPs will do things like punch biopsies and do suturing in cutaneous melanoma clinics. Um, and then here in the box in the little the lower right hand side here, I've kind of named some other unique areas depending on the actual place where the APPs work. If it's a large cancer center, these are more things that are likely to be available, but investigational therapeutics. So this is clinical trials. So um, in clinical settings where there's a lot of research going on, which happens a lot in cancer, APPs will be very involved um, with the evaluations of these patients um, and helping keeping track of their studies. Infusion centers, like I said, these are places where many of our cancer patients get their chemotherapy or come for transfusions or IV fluids. And so APPs, whether they staff the infusion center or on call for infusion centers to kind of evaluate patients for any acute issues is actually very helpful for patients and for centers that house um, cancer patients. Integrative medicine, this is unique to, to many, to most cancer places, um, but what it is, it's a, it's a place for kind of patients do some alternative medicine, but under the direction of medical providers. So these are patients that have a lot of questions about supplements that they wanna take. They might wanna do acupuncture, they might wanna do massage, and so having providers in these integrative medicine center is actually helpful to kind of weigh the risk and the pros and cons, I would say, of these alternative medicine treatments. Nocturnal hospital medicine, this is not unique to cancer, um, but in oncology centers, it's great to have oncology trained APPs that are able to recognize things like oncologic emergencies. Um, and again, this is relieving trainees to cover the night shifts at hospitals. And then oncologic emergency departments and urgent cares um, in many places um, have emergency centers or urgent cares that are specific for cancer patients only. And so APPs that are well versed in oncology actually play a, a big role in these centers as well. So survivorship. So this is actually a big place where many APPs play a role. Um, there are many, many places uh, actually everywhere that I've worked that have APP run survivorship clinics. So survivors in a cancer world are, is anybody that's been diagnosed with cancer and is still living. 
So patients, they will often get their treatment um, and stay with their primary, either medical oncologist or surgical oncologist for kind of a prescribed amount of time. They will stay um, with them during their active treatment, and then they will stay with them during their surveillance period. Um, as well. But when they kind of graduate, you know, depending on the stage of their disease, whether it's three to five years, when they graduate, having a survivorship clinic for these patients is, is actually very nice. And it's very good for these patients because they will transition back to their primary care doctor. But it's unique to them to be able to go see a provider that kind of understands their cancer journey, understands the side effects that they might be experiencing from their treatment that they've had for their cancer. And so having a survivorship clinic um, is actually very important and it's a very good kind of standard of care for cancer centers and APPs are barely um, readily available to do this and they're very capable to do this. So access. So access is, this simply means is how do we get patients into cancer providers? Like what are the barriers to timely and quality care? We know that improved access to effective cancer prevention, screening, treatment, and comprehensive cancer care can have a significant impact on outcomes, and APPs can certainly help reduce some of the barriers to access. You know, we know that, that the, in, the amount of cancer patients is rising, um, and while there is only so many hours in the day and so many providers, we have to figure out, like, how do we see all of these cancer patients, and, and this is where APPs have a big role. So APPs um, can help with initial consultations in many ways. So one is first touch. So at some organizations, even not in a cancer discipline, nurse navigators are utilized for this. However, cancer is often not straightforward. It's not just a common cold. Cancer is, is very complex and it requires more clinical expertise. And this is something that well-trained APPs have. You know, APPs, they're directly involved in patient care and they have the experience and the knowledge uh, and the ability to understand things like pathology reports. They can read and interpret diagnostic imaging and they can understand other factors that might determine where patients belong. And so APPs um, are able to help screen newly diagnosed patients and subsequently determine like, what's the best physician for this, this patient to see? Do they need any testing before coming to a visit? Do we need records? Do we need pathology? Do we need imaging? They have the understanding to kind of help with this first touch per se. Um, APPs can also help in seeing new patients in consults. If a physician's schedule is booked up for, you know, days, weeks at a time, APPs can certainly evaluate and begin treatment recommendation discussions with patients. And even after discussing with the physician, get patients started on treatment so that they're, they're not waiting as long. It's been shown that APPs engage from initial visit, you know, strengthen this relationship, and then it increases trust when they have to see the patient down the road. I have to say in my experience in oncology, I have been involved in most, I would say 90% of initial visits with patients. Um, and by patients meeting me on day one, they develop a relationship with me and a trust so that if there is not a physician available, they more often than not don't have problems coming to me um, for questions or help or advice. And I want to touch on this, the first touch over here again, this is so important why APPs can be involved um, in, in first touch and helping assign patients to physicians. So patients with a new cancer diagnosis are likely to experience cancer-related anxiety. They're anxious about the disease. They're anxious about the prognosis, um, how it's going to impact their life. And we can enhance the patient experience through a thorough, timely workup and physician assignment. And so the way I look at this is, if you imagine that you were diagnosed with cancer today, most patients would say, I want to see the doctor yesterday. And if they call and get an appointment to see the doctor the same day that they were diagnosed, they're very happy at that initial moment. But when they come to the, to the physician, there's some things that can happen. What if they're assigned to a physician that doesn't actually see the disease that they have? Well, now they're disappointed because they have to wait to be scheduled with the proper physician. So that's a delay. Or what if they get in with the right physician, but they don't have the appropriate workup? So the physician can't really tell them a whole lot. It's not a fruitful discussion. So the patient now has to wait to be scheduled for additional testing and then wait to get those results and then come back for yet another visit with the physician. So the anxiety builds. So while there could be a, a smaller delay in ensuring proper physician assignment, 
when you get to that position, you have all of the workup and all of the records that you need, then everybody is happier, right? Because the patient is getting all of the care and all of the answers that they need. And the, the healthcare team doesn't have the burden of trying to scurry and get records and scurry and get a patient scheduled for a CAT scan or an MRI. And so having APPs involved in access, um, while it might be burdensome for the APPs, is actually, is actually very helpful for the whole healthcare team, including the patient. Oh, I got ahead of myself there. Okay, so sorry. Okay, so back to the next thing, value-based care. So value-based care, we all hear about it all the time now. It improves to aim the quality and efficiency uh, of care for patients across all types of care, you know, oncology included. So bottom line is, is cancer is inconvenient and cancer is costly. If we think about how hard it is for healthy individuals to get to the dentist twice a year for a dental cleaning, it's a burden, right? We have to figure out how can we take time off work? Do we have to work around our kids schedule or other responsibilities? And it's only twice a year. So you have to imagine if you have a cancer diagnosis and the disruption of the disease itself, not to mention the treatment can cause to one life. So cancer patients, they're more likely to require ER visits and scheduled provider visits. They might need IV medications, IV fluids, blood transfusions, and it's costly. Cancer, it's expensive, even if you have health insurance. The economic burden associated with cancer in the U.S. in 2019 was over $21 billion. And much of that, not much of that, about $5 billion, you know, came from out-of-pocket costs for patients. Patients and caregivers require, um, you know, to come to visits, so they have substantial work absenteeism. And, but of course, this varies on the type of disease and stage. Some cancer patients even will delay treatments in order to prevent missing work. Um, and cancer cost, it doesn't impact all groups equally. Younger patients, less educated patients, um, and minority groups are more likely to incur higher costs associated with cancer. So while we can never make cancer care convenient, we can try to make it you know, a little bit more tolerable and APPs can help with this. So utilizing APPs in various settings in oncology to drive value-based care and ultimately improve patient satisfaction and, and experience. So think about an infusion center. These are places where we can So this is where patients, again, receive their chemo, their IV fluids, blood products, et cetera. So having the ability to offer patients appointments during non-traditional hours um, allows these patients and their caregivers to either work or tend to other responsibilities such as children. Um, and this, you know, it will also help to avoid some hospital um, admissions for things like IV antibiotics. And so not only are we improving the patient experience, but we're doing things like decreasing cost and decreasing the risk of hospital acquired infections. Um, another place that APPs can play are clinical decision units. So this is having a patient come to what we essentially would consider a 23 hour observation versus admitting them to the hospital. And these CDUs are often housed or staffed completely by APPs that are able to treat patients acutely and kind of make the decision, can we let them go home or should they really be admitted to the hospital? Um, the first touch evaluations, which we previously talked about in access and how important this is in providing good quality, efficient care to patients. Um, a mobile procedure team. So these are in some large institution now, and they're actually great to, to able to increase point of care procedures for patients. So many patients with cancer, you know, not only do they have to come to the, the doctor's office often, but they require things um, like paracentesis or thoracentesis. Um, and so these mobile procedure teams are available to be paged and they're often just staffed strictly by APPs. And this helps to prevent the patient from having to leave the clinic, go to another place like radiology, you sit in the waiting room and wait for a procedure to be done there. These are bedside procedures that can be done. And these mobile procedure teams are often staffed again, completely by APPs. Um, and then again, surgical APPs, they function in various perioperative roles. Not only do they first assist, but they can be available to do things like an h &P before a patient goes to the operating room while another case is finishing up. They can help with turnover in the case. They can close um, or start another case. So APPs are very helpful in this arena as well. So you want to pursue a career in oncology. So how do you do it? 
Um, so there's multiple different avenues. You know, we all know that in PA school and um, likely in NP school, unless you're um, becoming a certified nurse practitioner in oncology, there's very, very minimal education in oncology. I would say I wouldn't call my school and it was maybe a 10 minute blur, maybe a little bit more. Um, but some students are able to seek a rotation in oncology if their school offers an elective. I know that some large cancer institutions like MD Anderson will offer student rotations. Um, they're pretty selective, but that's one way to get your foot in the door um, because then you can kind of have an idea of one, if this is something you wanna do. And then also, you know people um, in this area as well. So that might be helpful to get a job in the future. Just networking, general networking, you know, looking for things, um, organizations or events in the area that might focus on oncology fellowships, which I'll dive into a little bit more deeply. And then of course, local, state and national organizations, like I was mentioning, um, there is Association of Physician Assistants in Oncology, which is actually an incredible group I've been involved with for several years. They have annual um, conferences, large conferences, they have regional conferences. Um, they have a student site on their um, website. They offer scholarships. So this is a great place to, to look as well. And they also, they also post jobs. Um, and then, you know, always the organizations, the AAPAs, and then the local chapters, you know, this is, you go to these, these meetings and you're able to meet people that might work in oncology. And then what all else fails, apply for jobs in oncology and see where it gets you. Um, that's actually how I started. I applied for a job um, at the University of South Florida when I got out of PA school, which was associated with Moffitt Cancer Center in Tampa. And somehow landed a job there. And then the rest of history is history. I've always been in oncology since then. So fellowships, so APP fellowships. So we've all know about fellowships for physicians. This is where they go to specialize in a field. Um, and there are many APP fellowships now, not just in oncology, um, but inexperienced APPs who begin careers in oncology, you know, they can face many challenges due to a lack of specialty training and not really knowing a lot about oncology. And if you face these challenges as a new APP, especially, you're more likely to be unsatisfied with your role because you don't feel confident. Um, you could be providing unsafe patient care and actually it's costly to organizations. Employee turnover is expensive um, and it's a burden too. So structured fellowship programs are designed to help better prepare APPs to practice confidently, improve their job satisfaction and contribute to the field of oncology because unless you're doing a good job, you're not really contributing um, to the field of oncology. So APP fellows, you know, rotate through a variety of disciplines within oncology, you know, to include, but not limited to inpatient and outpatient settings, surgeries, procedures, radiology, survivorship. And these, because the fellows are certified and licensed practitioners, you know, they can actively participate in patient care. Um, we had them at my last job, APP fellows would come to the clinic, they would see patients, they would document on patients. Um, while they would require some teaching during the time, they were actually super helpful. Um, they could help in surgery. They could help with procedures. So while they are there to learn, they're also there to actively participate. Um, so it's kind of a great, actually, it's a great way to get your foot in the door. APP fellowships are very selective um, and challenging to get into, um, but there are many now in, the, in across the country at larger centers. Um, in addition to their clinical rotations, APP fellows also have an academic curriculum to complete as well. So they're required to do an academic component. They often have to give lectures. They often have to have to do specific certification training. It just depends on where you do your fellowship at. So um, in summary, advanced practice providers in oncology are are, are growing in number and the need will grow in number as time goes on. So, you know, cancer is a chronic disease and the demand for oncologists is, is expected to exceed the number of practicing oncologists. And so APPs can help this, you know, help meet this growing demand for cancer care. Advanced practice providers can work in various roles in oncology to help meet patient demand and increase access to care. And they can enter a career in oncology through a number of different avenues, including by seeking additional training through oncology fellowships or certification. And that is all, um, and thank you very much.